I think I'm uh, coming down with a cough, maybe an infection. I have some yard work that... Uh... <coughs> anyway, I don't think that'll work, will it? <laughs> hey, do something for me. I want you to think to yourself right now how good God is. And follow that up with, I want you to pause and think how he created you good. There's a graph that I ended last week's message on, uh, not a graph, uh, uh, graphic. It says, G squared launches IO. Kind of a weird thing. I really dwelled on that a lot this week. It worked for me to remember that G squared simply is this, that God is good. And if you missed this message, go catch it on Facebook or on our website this week. It's uh, one of those foundation messages that's vital. It's important for every one of us to recognize in a crazy world, we often forget how good God is, and he's always good, and that we were made in his image, and therefore, in our innermost being, from the foundation, God created us good. And if we'll build on that foundation and recognize that that launches an I.O., I owe, we played on that multiple facets, that Christ died for us in our imperfections, even though we're created good and we've made choices to use our freedom to go against the boundaries of God. God sent Jesus to pay for that, so I owe him. But I owe the best way to owe Christ, and we can never pay him back for his free gift. It's a free gift. But I pray that that motivates us for the rest of our lives to honor him, to obey him, to do what he asks, and to do everything we can to owe him back, pay him back. That's best done to make sure that you're working on the inside out. That's what the I.O. really represents. That when I recognize God is good, he created me to be good, it launches me to begin to wrestle with my interior, to scuba dive into the dark spaces of my heart, and to begin to give those to God from the inside, which leads to outward Action. And so I want to build on that message a little bit. Before we're done here, I challenge every one of you that if you have one, two, three, or four of the total nasty monsters that can dwell inside of us, that before this, before you walk out the doors, you will have made a commitment to specifically do a few things to kill any or all of those monsters. Let's get into this. Stand with me. Here's the teaching and command of Jesus that's starting off our message today. If you're new, we're just standing out of reverence for this teaching of Jesus. This is the foundation for the message. Luke 11, 37 through 41, Jesus, uh, here's the story. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. Now, that's always a trap. Anytime a Pharisee, they were the religious leaders of the day. They did not like the fact that Jesus was taking their power. And they did everything they could to try to trick him. And anyway, this one is a sneaky attack to get him to come for a meal. If you're like me, you always come over for a good meal, right? So he went in, and he took his place at the table. And then it says, his host, the Pharisee, was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Notice what it does not say in that passage. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat first without performing the hand-washing ceremony required by the Jewish law. It does not say that. This is a tradition that these Pharisees and these religious leaders started, and I'm all for making a law. I would prefer you all wash your hands. I shake almost all of them as you're coming in. But it's not a law, all right? This guy's trying to make it a law, so I repeat. He sat down to eat. I can't believe you're doing this without first performing the ceremony required by our Jewish custom. Then Jesus said to him, you Pharisees. Oh, those are fighting words right there. You Pharisees, you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy. Thank you for inviting me into your house tonight for dinner, but you're all filthy. I mean, he's getting right at him here. You're full of greed and you're full of wickedness. Fools! (laughs) Fools! <laughs> Exclamation point. Uh, it's going to be an awkward dinner, isn't it? Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? This hits every one of us. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside, I.O. Clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor. You'll be clean all over. Pray with me. We'll sit down. Father in heaven, may your will be done as we gather together as your church inside this building. 
And we ask that you would uh, help us deal with the inside today. We know the outside will take care of itself. And so thank you for an opportunity to be here to honor you, to sing, to give you thanks and praise. We acknowledge how good you are. We publicly gather here to praise you and share how good you are. And we ask, Lord, that in these next few moments that you would help every one of us to only think about ourselves, not to think about what other people might need to change, and that we would literally be so much better because of this message and the things that we do to follow up with it. Jesus, it's all for you. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your authenticity and always being real. May we follow suit. And Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Go and be seated. <clears throat> Listen, when you're backed into a corner, it's in life when you're squeezed, that's what you're going to, that kind of action will display what's really going on inside of you. And that can go minute by minute sometimes, day by day, week by week, depending on what kind of week you got going on, what kind of pressures that you're facing in your work, in, in your home front, uh, in your recreation time, just whatever's going on in your life, you can get squeezed one week and another week, you can be squeezed exactly the same. One week comes out vile. The next week comes out love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this message is designed to help us deal with the things going on inside of us. So, if you make this commitment with me, every time we're squeezed, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control comes out. You wouldn't be here if you didn't desire that kind of thing to happen in your life, that kind of control, self-control, spirit-guided in your life. And I think today can help us work on that. I think if I pause and think of something more uh, practical, as Jesus says, the inside out, you guys look good on the outside, but on the inside you're full of all kinds of crazy things to the point being invited as a dinner guest, he calls his hosts fools. I think maybe, and I love to use Facebook as a, as a way to connect with friends and relatives or whatever to just see what's going on in our life, but I think we could all acknowledge that we never see on Facebook really what's going on in the inside. Sometimes you find out what's going on in the inside as you look at the post comments below the original post, but so many of us are so good on Facebook at posting what's going on on the outside of us, and wouldn't it be something... If suddenly it became impossible for us to cover up all the junk that we normally hide that's going on in the inside of us, wouldn't it be something if Facebook and technology had a, a direct connection to our heart, our soul, and our mind, and no matter what was going on around us, Facebook automatically posted publicly what was going on inside? I think all of a sudden we would all be really motivated to deal with the source of what's going on inside of us because we wouldn't be able to hide it anymore. And I always, when I say that, I pause and think it's crazy how we get so comfortable out into the world, we're really good at hiding what's going on inside of us. It's very natural for every single person on the planet. But God knows exactly what's going on inside all the time, our thoughts. He has the hairs on your head numbered. He knows every detail about us. And if we can live that kind of life in an acknowledgement, always remembering that God is good. If, if you're not careful what I just said, and you have your foundation built that God's kind of a meanie, He's a control freak. He's angry. You'll walk around in fear and turmoil and stress all your life. But when you know God is good, and He is patience. He is love. He is integrity. Now, it should help us go out into the world and go, God, I really, you're good. You've made me good. I want this to launch from the inside out. And I want to live my life owing you, making you proud. That if your eyes were to be laser beams going to and fro the earth, looking for somebody faithful, that when it hits my heart, it goes, dee, 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 found one. And every single one of us, I believe, desire that. So follow my thoughts through this. If, if the source 
on the inside of us. We're simply behavioral habits that we're trying to conquer, but we just can't. We, we would have conquered those already. Because deep down, the desire for us all is to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. If these were just habits, you and I would have conquered them already. These are not habits. These are monsters living inside of us. There's four of them. They're monsters. And you've got to understand they're not habits because you can break habits completely on your own. But what you and I have to do to kill the monsters takes way more than just a little trying to start a new habit. So let me ask you some questions. What's going on inside of you? Think of the moments when you're getting squeezed. Do you have feelings of anger and resentment? You have feelings of hatred that rise up? Someone's hurt you. Those feelings, do they torment you? Do they cause outward actions that you're not proud of? Timothy Keller, he wrote this, a sure sign of the presence of idolatry. Okay, idolatry. Uh, the sign that you are an idol worshiper, or I am an idol worshiper is that there's uh, an inordinate amount of anxiety, an inordinate amount of anger, discouragement. Those things really surface when we get squeezed. Usually, when you just, how do you say this? When somebody squeezes you and the nasty comes out, it's because somebody's messing with an idol in your life. And the deep thinking that you've got to do, and I say this frequently, that we pause often. We should pause often. I recommend daily. I do daily. Where I take an hour, at least, and I'm in God's Word, and I'm trying to sort out, I'm journaling some thoughts about what's going on inside of me, the why I do, or the why I respond sometimes when I'm squeezed. And if you're not wrestling with those on a regular basis, those idols will take over your life, and when you are squeezed, you're going to feel it, and everybody else around you is going to feel it as well. Let me finish this quote here. A sure sign of the presence of idolatry is an inordinate anxiety, anger, or discouragement when our idols are thwarted or challenged or stolen or whatever. So if we lose a good thing, it makes us sad. But if we lose an idol, it devastates us. So the things in your life where you really get angry Start questioning, what is it that's causing this anger to come out of me? It's probably an idle form of worship. And God clearly says in the top ten of the old Jewish covenant, thou shall have no other idols before me. Another author, Dr. Henry Cloud, says this, there's a reason why some people are able to lose or get squeezed, whatever term you want to use. There's a reason why some people are able to lose and come back. Recover well, and others stay stuck. Those who get stuck, it says they can't surrender and face the feelings and the meaning of the loss. So they hang on to something that's dead, that's over, that's in the past. It's that very thing that creates victimhood mentalities. And this morning, I want us to conquer all victimhood by accepting full responsibility of what's going on inside of me or you and literally dealing with it. And there's four monsters that you are required to kill. All right? Here's the first one. It's real simple. Guilt. Do you feel guilty about anything? If you do, that guilt, maybe you haven't thought about it before. Guilt is the Holy Spirit inside of you, if you will, challenging that monster of guilt and getting you to recognize guilt says this. I owe somebody. Back to I owe. I owe somebody. I feel guilty. I've done something to somebody, and guilt is overpowering me. And if we're really good in our society, bombarded with outside messages and music and putting in our earphones and, and just tuning out the guilt that's going on inside of us, and I would just encourage you to dwell on it. Why do I feel guilty? And the way simply to kill the monster of guilt is I must apologize. So before this week is over, as you leave and if you've acknowledged this morning that guilt is a monster inside of you and you're carrying it around because you know you owe somebody, then I would ask you, God would beg of you, lower the pride, let humility take over, recognize that guilt is a monster in you that's eating you from the inside out. 
And you'll never conquer it unless you go take care of the issue that you created. Accept responsibility for the parts that you've done and you do your part to go apologize. You can't control how they accept an apology. You can't control how they treat you from that. That's between God and them and God's working on the monsters inside of them. All you are asked of God to do is to apologize if guilt is a monster inside of you that's controlling. Listen to Psalm 38. I'm on the verge of collapse, facing constant pain, but I confess my sins. I'm deeply sorry for what I have done. Ah, oh, it's a powerful sentence. You free yourself. You kill the monster inside of you when you drop your pride, and I drop my pride, and I go apologize to those I need to. Now be careful if you say, I don't have any guilt inside of me. Listen to the tone that's going on internally when you say that. Maybe you don't have any guilt. That's a beautiful thing. But just be careful. It's so easy to ignore guilt in our society today, the feelings of guilt, because everybody's angry. Everybody's got stuff going on, and we can so point fingers. I'm just asking you on this one. If you have the monster of guilt inside of you, and he's the gentlest of the four. He's the simplest one of the four. Monster number two is anger. Uh, some of you may say, Renner, I heard you do this message. I couldn't, I think it's been a year. I think I was counting this morning in my head, probably about five, maybe six messages that I simply recycle because the foundation information in it is so very good. And if you're like me, you need to be reminded on a regular basis because I forget. For those of you who maybe heard a previous version of these four monsters, I, I spoke them in the, the, uh, the acronym of GAG, Jesus, G-A-G. Guilt, anger is where we're at. Greed is the next one, and jealousy is the fourth one. And I remember those four by those four monsters, GAG, Jesus. And so here's number two, anger. Anger says this, if you're angry, somebody's hurt you. Somebody has hurt you. Anger is not the first emotion. Hurt is where you felt hurt of any kind and you did not deal with it. You did not go to the person directly and talk about it. Admit that you've been hurt by them. Again, you can't control. It's not my fault I hurt you. Wuss. Suck it. You can't control how they treat you. Anger says this. You or somebody owes me. Guilt says I owe you. Anger says, you owe me. Now, here's the deal. The way to kill this monster of anger is this. I've got to forgive. Because if you pause and think about it, is there anything? Think of somebody, think of something that has happened to you that really caused hurt. There's nothing that person can do to remove that original hurt. There's nothing that person can do to ever make it okay. It's okay that you did it. No, it was not okay. There's nothing they can do. And every morning, if you're not careful, or every day, and sometimes if you've really been hurt and you didn't deal with it, it's the anger raging inside of you that affects every other category in your life, how you drive, how you parent, how you employer or employee. It affects anger, does nasty things to everybody all around us, but even worse on the inside of us. And so anger says that somebody owes me. The problem is they can't pay me back. And the reality is most never will pay me back. There's, I mean, there's a lot of talks right now about the word reparations. It's fascinating how real these four monsters are in an American culture that's leaked into our politicians and created this chaos of a crazy country, even in the midst of a lot of things in our country going so very well. But look, when you're watching TV and seeing this stuff going on, look for the four monsters. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. They will always surface if you pause and think about them. But the problem is, stop pointing them out and everybody else and pay attention to the one inside of you. So back to this forgiveness issue. If you don't forgive somebody, anger continues to live in your life, and anger always needs a target. Anger just inside of you is always going to, that's why we're pointing. 
We're looking for a target. Something's going on inside of me, and man, somebody owes me, and the problem is they're not going to owe you. Because if you think about it, hurt people hurt people. So somebody who has hurt you, straight up, they've been hurt. That's why they're hurting others. It doesn't make it okay. This is just fact. Now here's the issue. If they're not dealing with their hurt, and they have hurt you, They probably, the next day, if you haven't been in contact with this person in a while, you think they're thinking about you? You think they get up every morning? I pray that they have the Holy Spirit in them and that guilt is working on them. But usually in our culture, we ignore guilt. So the person who hurt you that you're now angry at is not thinking about you ever. But almost every minute or every hour or in the morning or in the evening, The devil is really good at this, gets you. Remember what they did to you? And you're thinking about them all the time. You are allowing the person who hurt you, who is now no longer ever thinking about you, maybe out hurting other people, you're allowing them to live rent-free in your life. Every day they're in your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so what you have to do, because you are not guaranteed they'll ever pay you back, they can't pay you back. An apology helps, but the hurt still happened. Anger has many shapes. Uh, When angry, children uh, withdraw, children wet beds, husbands withdraw behind work and cell phones. Uh, Gossip happens over coffee. We drown ourselves in alcohol or food or pills or other drugs. That's what anger does. That's what anger does. And so real quick, a true or false question, think to yourself the answer. Everybody gets angry on occasion. Even Jesus got angry. The answer is true. Everybody. That's a power word. Imagine being so angry that you walked up into the temple and made a whip. And you whipped people out. It's funny, you don't hear that story in church very often. Jesus walked into the temple. It says he knocked over tables. He chased the money changers away. He whipped them out of the temple. Now, he couldn't have... I kick over this table nicely because I love you, and I'm whipping you gently. <laughs> it's funny how we, we in our culture today have created what is sin and what is not sin. We need to pause and think about. That's deep. It would require a lot of discussion. Jesus got angry, and he physically, and it had to have been somewhat violently, tipped and kicked over those tables, threw the money. People fled screaming. Go read the story in the Gospels. Everybody gets angry on occasion. Jesus was deeply wounded and hurt in this situation where he saw his father's house turned into a place where people were being taken advantage of, taken to the market, all under the guise of worship. There's many positive ways to deal with anger. Some with anger work by chopping wood, scrubbing floors, taking a hot or a cold shower, going and retreating. Those are good ways to deal with anger, but they will not kill the monster of anger living in each one of us. There are ways to drain present anger, but past hurts, as you drain them on those healthy things to do, take a boxing class, whatever it is you do, You can drain some anger, but the hurts remain and fester and build pressure again, and then you get squeezed, and then you respond, and now you're a hurt person hurting other people. You've got to break. We've got to break the vicious cycle, and that means forgive. Many find uh, when they pin their feelings down, this is the importance of a journal, and they're writing these feelings out in words, why am I dealing with this? that the anger from that situation in the past now begins the process of healing because you're dealing with it in depth internally, not just covering it up externally. Conquering anger, killing the monster of anger in us is settled. It's killed through forgiveness. This means, when you forgive somebody, this means that you truly believe that Jesus' sacrifice For the full payment of sin covered their sin and their personal offense against you as well, right? If you will not forgive and release the anger and kill the anger monster in you, you end up in your own self-made prison. I've done diagrams in the past where I have a stick figure standing behind bars and the keys are dangling from his pocket. 
And they're just so angry they're in this prison. And there's the keys. And it's forgiveness. Who do you need to forgive? Before you do, let's talk about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness, uh, think of this. In the shadow of hurt, when I'm angry, I'm in a shadow, I'm in a dark place. That's the shadow of hurt. Forgiveness, giving forgiveness will feel like it's a decision to reward my enemy. And there's the first problem. You think the person that hurt you is your enemy. They're not your enemy. Remember, God is good and he made all people good. That's how he designed us. And if we get into the mentality that other people are our enemy, the devil doesn't even need to show up as the true enemy. He's like, they're fighting themselves. You ever read the stories where God intervenes and like 300 Israelites go on and take on 10,000? And, and God gets it so stirred up that the 10,000 ended up killing themselves and the 300 were like, we won that? How do we win that battle again? Well, they killed each other. The enemy doesn't even need to show up because we're killing each other. We've got to learn how to deal with the monster of anger inside of us where we think somebody owes us and they can never repair. They can never make it right what they did. So you now have to kill the monster. And the most difficult thing to do is to give forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just letting time pass. It's not disregarding the wrong that another person has done against you. It's not pretending that the offense really didn't matter. God made me tougher than that. These are not true forgiveness. And you will not experience freedom from your prison if that's how you go. Your offender was in the wrong, but you are the one who ends up in bondage, rent-free. They're not thinking about you. You're thinking about them. So here's the deal. And you have to, if you're a follower of Jesus especially, if you're not a follower of Jesus, eat, drink, and be merry. Do whatever you want to do. There's no boundaries on you. And those of you who are followers or those of us who are followers of Christ, shame on us for putting boundaries on people when they don't have any boundaries. We need to do a better job of honoring the boundaries that we have in our own lives because we have acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life and I believe He will return and I will be held accountable for my actions and my words. But if you're not a follower of Christ, the worst thing that can happen is a bunch of people who are followers try to put boundaries on them. They don't have any boundaries. I would encourage you to be careful being around them. There's danger in that kind of a setting. You have to really be secure in your faith to encounter, to be light that goes into a dark world and not turn into darkness. But it can be done. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus became the complete payment for all sin. His blood is shed once and for all, and it's powerful enough to cover every sin throughout all the ages, even the sin that those committed against you. Question, have you ever offended In fact, let's get personal in here. If you have offended or hurt anyone in your life, would you please raise your hand? I need to see all hands or I'm calling you out. (laughs) Did Jesus die for your sins? Then you need to believe that Jesus' blood was thick enough to cover your offender's sins. When you're angry and resentful, And unforgiving, you're saying to the face of God, they're not good enough. Your blood didn't cover their sins. You made a mistake on the. Do you realize how dangerous that is to get into the face of God and say that? And none of us would ever say it, but when we don't forgive people who have hurt us, we're screaming in the face of God because actions speak louder than words that He's a screw up, that that one's too bad to be forgiven. Ah, do you see the pride, the lack of humility? So we've sinned and been forgiven. We've hurt others and been forgiven. Now take the courageous step to be the one who offers forgiveness. True forgiveness is choosing to accept the blood of Jesus as the full payment for what your offender did, period. Turn them over to the hands of God. And let God deal with the consequences. Now, it doesn't mean, I mean, let's think of an extreme case of a woman who has been raped. Nowhere in Christianity does it say that you have to be fully restored and in a full relationship with that person. 
Restoration in that setting is that you need to offer forgiveness. You need to let the pain no longer and the anger reside in you. Don't live in that victim mentality. And you use that situation now to be wise and experienced and help others. Now you've conquered an extreme tragedy that has happened to you without allowing the monster of anger to rule your life and ruin you and your relationships around you. That's what we're all called to do. True forgiveness is choosing to accept Jesus' blood as the payment for all sin. Choosing to forgive is an act of pure discipline. Never in your life, I have never met somebody who has got up in the morning and said, I can't wait to forgive so-and-so for what they did to me. Can you imagine? That's not a natural feeling. If you feel that, you are remarkable. We need to go to coffee. I need to learn how you can do that. Because I suppose it could get there because Jesus is that good. And somebody can recognize how healthy forgiveness is that you could wake up one morning and be so excited to go give forgiveness because you realize it's the keys that get you out of your own prison, right? It's rare to feel like forgiving someone. It's a choice to break free from the bondage. Listen to a couple passages I want to read. I don't think they're going to be on the screen today. Listen to the first one, Matthew Chapter 5, 23 through 24, it says this. So if you're presenting a sacrifice, I could translate that. If you're coming to the church and gathering as the church, I never like to call this thing the church. It's not the church. I used to never let my kids, hey, Dad, when are we going to church? I'm like, what do you mean? We can't go to church. They're like, Dad, what are you talking about? When are we going to church? What time is church? I'm like, no, no, no. We're the church. Oh, oh, you mean when we're going to gather? When the church is going to gather inside of that building? Oh, and they're like, oh, they just so, they had to deal with the monster of anger inside of them, didn't they? I realized what I did to them. If you're presenting, if you're, if you're I'm going to say it, if you're coming to church and you're about to take communion, you're at the altar. The altar isn't some altar table up here with communion trays on it and candles and religious Bells and whistles. The altar is where the Holy Spirit resides. That's inside your soul. You're here and you're confronting the altar. And you're ready to take the sacrificial elements that represent Jesus, His body and His blood. And you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice. Leave the church building. Leave the spot. Set the communion elements down and walk out. For what you are doing in this setting has no impact on God at all. He's like, why are you here? And what is communion? God, forgive me for my sins. And then we walk out the doors going, oh, I hate. I can't stand. Do you see the blasphemy? Do you see the hypocrisy? He says, somebody has something against you. Leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Go and kill the guilt. Offer an apology. Or go send the email, make the phone call, do the personal visit, and say to somebody, what you did was not okay. I want you to know I forgive you. And I don't know what this means for the rest of our lives, but this is the first step that I want to do today. And then come back. I don't care if it's on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, or a Friday. Come back and say, Renner, we killed the monster. Can I take communion now? I'll come down here and sing a song with you. And I'll come down and pray with you. We'll take communion together because there's nothing greater than killing the monster of anger. It's destroying your life if it's controlling you. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come offer your sacrifice. Listen to Matthew 18. I'm so used to a digital Bible, it's almost weird to use a paper one anymore. It's kind of cool, though. Matthew 18, 21 and 22 says this. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And the rule back in that day was three times. So when Peter said seven times, Peter was like, I'm going to wow you, Jesus. I'm going to go beyond. I'm going to double it plus the normal forgiveness ratio here because I really want you to be proud of me, Lord. Seven times? Oh, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 
And you'll know you have the monster of anger thriving in you, in you if you're pulling out your calculator right now trying to figure out how many times that is. Jesus didn't mean a specific number. He meant forgive. Because that's what he did when he died on that cross. For every sin you've committed and for the ones that you are going to commit. And you are not and I am not better than Jesus. Offer the forgiveness that Christ warrants upon all of us. Last one, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It's one simple sentence. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Now, it looks different for everybody. That means you're going to have to have some boundaries in your life. There's some people in your life, every time you come around them, they, they revive from the dead the monster of anger in your life. And therefore, you've got to forgive them again. And you'll be sitting in your backyard sometimes and you'll be journaling it out and you're doing all the right things to be spiritually strong. And that stinking devil will show up, invisible, and he'll get in your ear and you can almost hear his voice. Remember what they did to you. Remember why you're doing what you're doing now. Remember what they did to you. Remember everything that's led up to this point in your life. And you should be able to say in that moment, yes, I remember, Satan, but I also remember forgiving them. Please go back to hell. That's what you tell him. Say it out loud. And he'll leave and come back for another opportune time. Maybe in an hour. Maybe in a year. But I promise he will come back again. How many times do we forgive? Do you need to leave the altar and go be reconciled? And do everything that you can to live in peace with everyone. So to conquer anger is to set the prisoner free only to realize I'm the prisoner. The prisoner is me. It's a sentence. To conquer anger is to set a prisoner free only to realize the prisoner was me. Not being able to forgive someone, says Mother Teresa, is like you drinking poison and hoping it kills your offender. That's what unforgiveness in the, is in your life. And you recognize forgiveness to kill that monster. You offer forgiveness to somebody else. And what you're doing is you're setting yourself free and you stop poisoning yourself. I hope that makes sense. And if you need help forgiving somebody, I will walk with you the entire process. Help you calm down, give you things that you need to say or do. And I've dealt with some people that they need to forgive people who passed away. They've been gone for 10 years. There's no way to send the email. There's no way to make the phone call. They're gone and they didn't take the pain with them. And I offer, you've got to do something physical. I recommend writing a letter to the person that hurt you so deeply and is now not here. Put it on a helium balloon. And if you're an environmentalist, I apologize. Get a biodegradable balloon. Put helium in it and watch it float away. Send that letter to the loved one that's no longer around. Just you got to do something physical. I really believe that. Uh, write something down this winter when you've got your fire going. And take it. Take what they did to you, you wrote down, and put it in the fire and watch it burn up. I have physically been with people and walked them through this process. And we made a little pot fire. And they wrote it on their card. And I have seen people literally shake like spasms going through their bodies trying to let go and kill the monster of anger inside of them. And you should see the action of when they finally, with, it's like it took every, like they're lifting 600 pounds to just release it, the freedom that they begin to live in. Oh, it's not easy after that, but it's easier. All right, we've got to keep going on. Guilt says, I owe you. Anger says, you owe me. So guilt requires me to apologize. Anger requires me to forgive. If you recognize all of these monsters require something of me, even if I were the victim, you have to accept responsibility. You can't accept responsibility for what somebody did to you, but you and I have to accept responsibility for how we behave from this point forward, right? And so number three is simply greed. Greed says, I owe me. This is an easy one. I owe me to kill the monster of greed. I've just got to become a giver. I would encourage you, if you wrestle with greed, I'll say it this way. If you're, well, it could be both. I, I don't want to be sexist here. If you're female, typically, go into your closet. Maybe it's your favorite pair of shoes. It's your favorite outfit. 
and go give it to somebody who it just needs it. Begin to conquer greed in your life. If you're a guy, there's a million different things you've got to do. It's probably a silly tool. Uh, what is it in your life that you're like, oh, I really love this. And if you just are known internally and by others as greedy, you've got to begin to break it. Start giving and experience the freedom in giving. The best way to conquer greed in your life is, is and, and to recognize if you do have greed in your life, is to begin asking yourself, do I give back to the Lord? This isn't me asking for your money. If, if I were money hungry and that was my priority, we'd be passing trays around here all the time. I trust God and I trust you to be people who read the scriptures. But if you're somebody that just, your blood begins to boil every time a preacher begins to talk about money, number one, stop blaming the TV evangelist who's out of control. Start asking yourself, why when somebody talks about money, I squeak when I walk? I'll make fun of you. Greed is a monster that's tearing you up. And the only way you beat it and kill it is be a giver. Listen to Proverbs 21. Some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. How about this number four? Jealousy then says, this is the nastiest of them all. Guilt says, I owe you. Anger says, you owe me. Greed says, I should give. Greed says, I owe me. So I got to give. Jealousy says, the most nasty, God, you owe me. You caused, you allowed them to win that. You allowed them to have that. You could blink your eyes and give it to me as well. God, you've made a mistake. God, you owe me. Oh, me, oh, me, oh, me. Dangerous. I know you agree with me. That's a dangerous phrase. And to kill the monster of jealousy, i got to celebrate. I've struggled in my past with jealousy and comparisons. It's not really the thing anymore. I have practiced this and preached this message at least once a year for at least 15 years. And I have learned to practice these. And I can say in, in all of my messages, I've gotten good at these four monsters. Oh, the, things, the, the monsters creep up. But I'm getting good at killing them. I'm a monster killer. I love that. And as these are things that I've done, and I've learned how to, uh, it used to be crazy when I was in my 20s and young 30s. There's a list that goes out in the world to be in the, it, it's the fastest growing churches in the nation. And I led a church that was in the top 100 of the fastest growing churches in the nation. And it never mattered if I was number 10. Guess where I was spending most of my attention? Number nine. How many they got? How many butts can we get in a chair? And it was never really about that to me, but there's just a competitive nature that I have. And it's fascinating that jealousy will just destroy a person. Compare, compare, compare. It's really the big monster of what Facebook does, Instagram. My wife, and they're not in here yet, so I'll, I probably won't share this second service. Uh, <laughs> Mia just turned 17. He's just your normal, awesome teenager. Instagram has these filters. You can... You can Put a filter on it. Oh, you're, I don't do this, but some of you may, this smooth skin. And, and Kelly asked Mia, what's this big deal going on? And so she goes, Mia says, well, watch this, Mom. She said, look here. And this is Kelly's normal appearance, no filter. And she said, now watch this. And Kelly was like, okay, what? And she goes, well, let's do it together. And she went back. She goes, see how we are with the filter? And then she goes, unfilter. And she goes, <laughs> and started laughing at Kelly. And it's crazy what Facebook does to us. We want this false imagery. We want to look prettier than how we were actually are, just natural and as beautiful as we can be as God made us. If you're not careful, this creates jealousy. And the way you've got to do is to celebrate. God, thank you for allowing such great success in that person's life. I pray that you would bless them. Thank you for allowing this to happen and them to benefit from that and that. You are a good God. May they give you thanks for having such wonderful things happen in their life. And if you take that attitude, you will kill the monster of jealousy inside of you. So James 3, and we wrap it up. If you're wise and understanding God's way, prove it by living an honorable life from the inside out. Doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom but if you're bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. 
crazy. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every kind of evil. Wrap it up. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him over for a meal. He went in and he took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by the Jewish custom. Then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy, full of greed and wickedness. Fools! Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor, and you'll be clean all over. What monster do you need to walk out of here and go kill? Or what monsters? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Help us be monster killers this week. Help us be aggressive with it. Help us have it be the utmost priority this week so that we can continue to live and be the good people, getting better every day that you designed us to be. We love you, Lord. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Love you all. If there's anything I can do to help you kill any monsters, let me know.